Dog Works Radio is sponsored by Alaska Dog Works. Check out their website at alaskadogworks.com. You can support this podcast on patreon.com forward slash first paw media. Radio Free Palmer 89.5 KVRF presents Mushing Radio, hosted by Robert Forto. Mushing Radio is about dog-powered sports, living in the Great White North, and mushing. Visit our website at mushingradio.com. Here is your host, Robert Forto. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Robert Forto and you're listening to Mushing Radio here on KBRF 89.7 in the Matsu Valley. RadioFreePalmer.org is our live streaming site, and you can hear all of our episodes over on DogWorksRadio.com. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, and you will never miss an episode. And today, I am joined by my co-host, Tony Ryder, calling in from the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska. Tony, how's it going? Going well. Um, it's I, I'm going to say it. It's full-on fall down here on the Kenai Peninsula. Uh, it's very wet. Um, my gully pond is turning uh, very quickly into a lake, um, so I am thinking more and more about how I would really just like the rain to be over and it be snow and we get into the mushing season. Yes, mushing season is upon us. The official, unofficial start of the mushing season, at least in terms of training, is typically September 1st. That's when Everything changes when the weather uh, it gets cooler at night, uh, cooler in the in the daytime. So yeah, a lot of training starts to happen in just a couple of weeks, and usually the kickoff to that is the Alaska State Fair. And in many years <laughs> past, the Iditarod had a pretty big deal happening at the fair. Do they still do that now, or is that sort of tapered off a bit since the uh, since COVID and all that? Yeah, you know, I haven't seen, I haven't actually really been looking though because I never get up to the fair. I always want to go and then stuff gets in the way. So I get kind of jealous of everybody going up. So I just don't pay attention to the fair news. Um, but yeah, they normally, normally you're meeting with the Iditarod champions of years past, maybe even the um, the champion, the current champion. Um, puppies are there, dogs are there. Um, they have a booth, and they're always trying to uh, sell off their raffle tickets because they have their fall raffle, which is very similar to what they have in the um, spring during Iditarod, where you can, it used to be you could win a truck, now you can just win a lot of money or some really cool uh, trips and stuff like that. So um, I'm not sure if they're doing any meet and greets this year. I would hope that they are, but like I said, I haven't, I haven't really seen anything about the fair other than, Hey, don't forget to buy our raffle tickets. Um, but that's definitely something I'll probably be looking into after this conversation here. <laughs> yes. And, uh, we have a pretty big story to talk about here in just a second, but just a little bit of of news and updates before we jump into that. Uh, Before we talk about the Yukon Quest, we've talked a lot about that in uh, in our show's past, but I saw on Facebook today a post from Martin Booser and his kennel operation. I've been there a few times, but I've never been a part, I've never been to see his sort of presentation or his show. Man, he's got it going on there. It looks like a a full-on visitor center, doesn't it? Uh, Yeah, you know, um, I've never actually been to Martin's Kennel either, but every picture that I've seen, um, I think he and Jeff King really both have really great setups for visitors. Um, They're well-established tourist destinations. A lot of tours come through there, um, both from cruise ships or, you know, in the case of Jeff, he gets a lot of train uh, activity. Um, and that sort of thing, those going into Denali. So, um, yeah, no, Martin's, Martin's place, though, I mean, he's, I think, one of the first ones, if not the first one, to recreate the Burled Arch uh, for his uh, Happy Trails kennel. Um, that's one of the first things I think you see. It's kind of like Jurassic Park. You drive underneath it, and then here's this dog kennel. 
Um, but yeah, I think he's got a bed and breakfast now. I think I've seen so uh, Martin. Martin knows how to uh, to really impress everybody. Yeah, I remember when my daughter Nicole was running her first junior Iditarod, and they did the start and the finish, I believe, at uh, Martin's place, and that was several years ago. And that was when he was first starting that uh, that visitor center, which is totally separate from his house. I mean, it looks like a museum from what he has it set up now. And, <laughs> uh, and I say that, guys, because I know if a lot of folks that listen to this show obviously travel up to Alaska during Iditarod or in the summer or whatever. That is definitely a Iditarod bucket list item if you get a chance. I'm sure he's open year long, but of course, during Iditarod, you probably won't get a chance to meet Martin, but at least you'll be able to see that cool uh, display he has going on. Yeah, and I think we should give a shout out too. He just became a grandfather not too long ago. Roan and his wife had a had a little boy, so congratulations, Boozer family. Excellent, excellent. So let's talk about the Yukon Quest. Since our last show, they did their early signups, and uh, that happened both in Alaska and Canada. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, they. Um, I think they had signups on the same day, even so. Uh, kind of interesting because I think the overall goal, since they're not starting their race on the same day, is the goal is to have teams do both. But uh, they didn't. They didn't really do that with the signups, so it's it's kind of interesting. Um, but I think I, I think for everything going on, their their lists aren't too bad. Right. And you can find out more about that over on their collective websites. And as we talked about on our last show, it looks like Canada's side of the Yukon Quest has all the online assets. Is that still the case? Yeah, it looks like it. Um, Yukon Quest Alaska is how you find the Alaska side of things. They've got their own website now that's up and running. Um, they've got their own Facebook page. Um, they've got their own team of people promoting all over social media. So um, I think that while in the divorce, so to speak, uh, Canada got the established uh, domain and, and social media, uh, Alaska is, it, it's working up there. It's only got about a 828 people following it right now, but I'm sure once people uh, get into the mushing season, there there will be more followers on their page. And do you know by chance how many followers the uh, the Yukon Quest page has? I'm looking that up right now. They have 85,473 people following right now. Wow! So just uh, just <laughs> a, a little bit more than the uh, than the Alaska side. So hopefully, yeah, just the, a couple. The, just a couple. So hopefully, they're able to. <laughs> to uh, share their news. I'm sure that they've always done a really good job uh, with social media on the quest. And and I always enjoy following that race because uh, I'm not a, I'm not a tracker guy. I know a lot of big time I did a rod and Yukon quest fans are huge tracker nerds. And I've never been one of those. I'll just do a quick refresh or whatever uh, before we do our <laughs> podcast. But other than that, I'm not obsessively, hitting refresh on my computer. Are you a, a tracker nerd during I did a rod? Uh, I think we all know that I am. I'm not so much, I'm not like um, a Danny CB who's sitting there and analyzing every little minute detail on the tracker and doing all of the math. Um, but I, I'm definitely, I've got it up. I, I honestly, when, um, they asked me at work if I wanted to have another monitor connected to my computer. I was like, yeah, because then I can have my little tracker up all race long while I'm at work. Um, you know, it's, it's not distracting enough that I'm not getting my work done, but I've got that up there so that I can keep tabs on, on the teams and what's going on on the races. So um, I'm not sure if that qualifies me as a nerd, but I'm a definite fan girl. Here's to the adventure seeking dog mushers out there. The hundreds of you who stand on the runners dreaming and thinking about the Northern Lights. Of course, there is something else you can do if you've got something to say. Start a podcast with First Paw Media and harness your creative side. Maybe even earn enough money. Enough money to tell yourself, hey, I'm not just a dog musher. I'm a rover. I'm a wanderer. I'm a voyager. 
I'm an explorer. Visit firstpa.media. Mush on over today. All right, guys. So let, <laughs> let's jump over to our story for tonight. Uh, for uh, big time fans of Iditarod, and, and I say that because obviously this is off season news, but it's big news in terms of the mushing world and the Iditarod world in particular. Lance Mackey did an interview a couple of weeks ago with uh, one of the folks from Iditarod, Greg Heister, I believe is how you say his name. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty telling. And we're going to talk about that interview in just a few minutes. But we want to sort of set the, the legacy, if you will. And of course, we do not need to do that. Anybody that knows of Lance knows the legacy behind him and his family's name. But for new folks that are new to following mushing, you may find this of interest. Tony, what can you tell us about the Mackie lore in terms of long distance mushing and everything that goes with it before we talk about the Lance story? Sure. So the Mackies are pretty synonymous with uh, Iditarod. Um, they go, they're right up there with the Reddingtons um, and even now the Seavies. Um, but the Mackies, uh, Dick Mackey, who is Lance's father, he helped Joe Reddington uh, start the Iditarod. He was one of the Iditarod trailblazers, as they're called now. Um, he has been race marshal in the past. He also has one of the most um, famous finishes. He beat um, Rick Swenson, who would go on to win five, but at the time, um, Rick was still trying to get that win. Um, or get those multiple wins, I should say. Um, Dick Mackey won the Iditarod by one second ahead of uh, Rick Swenson, and they didn't even really know how to call the finish because it was so close. Was it the nose of the first dog or when the sled crosses? And Dick's uh, team, their lead dog, crossed the finish line first, so they went with that. Um, and then what's, what's interesting is uh, and part of the Lance Mackey lore, not so much the Mackey family, but really what what really puts the Mackeys back um, in the center of the Iditarod lore was um, Dick Mackey won with lucky number 13 for his bib number. Then his son Rick in the 80s won his Iditarod. Uh, wearing bib number 13. And then Lance's first win uh, many years later uh, would be uh, with lucky number 13. So um, they're, they're known as a down-to-earth uh, family. They're known for, um, they're known for just being dog people. Uh, there's a lot of Mackies still within the mushing community. You have uh, Lance's brother Jason is still, uh, I think he's even signed up this year for Iditarod, as I recall. Um, he's got nieces. Uh, he's got his niece that's run the Iditarod. She didn't finish, but she she, she should have. Um, Brenda Mackey, of course. Uh, so they're, they're very much involved with Iditarod. Um, there's a lot of history there between Dick and Rick and Lance and Jason, uh, especially within the race. Um, they're probably one of the most dynamic teams um, and charismatic. I don't think you can be bored listening or reading about the Mackies. Um, they're, they're, they're important to Iditarod. They're important to the fans. They're relatable. Um, I, I don't know how else to describe it other than to say that, you know, yes, the Reddington name is synonymous with Iditarod because of uh, Joe being the father of Iditarod. But Dick Mackey um, and the Mackey crew, they, they've they played a significant role in the history and, and the future of Iditarod. So let's jump over to Lance. Of course, that is a, a name that uh, is, is very synonymous with not only the Iditarod, but the Yukon Quest, even the Ferrandi. Uh, the stage stop. I mean, this guy literally, literally has raced all over the country and pretty much any time he has uh, set his mind to it, he has finished and won multiple times. 
He has some impressive records, of course, under his belt. He is the only four-time winner of the Iditarod and the Quest, uh, I believe. Is that correct? Uh, or is that even more special four times in a row or something like that? Right, yeah. There there are a couple of mushers that have won more Iditarods, but Lance is the only one to win four consecutive um, there have been a couple of, mu- well, a few mushers that have gotten close to that consecutive four, um, but only Lance has been able to do it. And on top of that, on those same years for, I believe, three of the four, um, he also won the Yukon Quest. Um, and he was one of the first mushers to really prove that his team could run both the Yukon Quest and the Iditarod in the same year and be competitive, obviously, since they won both races. Um, It was something that Lance noticed that his dogs, after running a thousand miles in the Quest, if they rested leading up to the Iditarod, they didn't do as well competitively and bouncing back um, as they did if he went from one race and kept um, not a heavy load of training, but kept up those miles to then go straight into the Iditarod. Um, And it really kind of changed a lot of mushers thinking. And we started to see more and more teams go from a competitive um, quest run to then going straight into Iditarod. Ali Zirkel and Alan Moore, um, I think, are another great uh, example of that. Allie um, would run the 300, but Allen would want run their team, their A team in the quest, sometimes winning, always being very competitive with them. She'd go on to run that same team in the Iditarod and also became very competitive that way, knocking on that door, coming very close to, to winning the Iditarod. You know, she was second place several times with those teams. So, um, it, Lance changed the sport. He changed the sport, or at least changed the race. I shouldn't say the sport in general, but um, he changed the way that thousand mile races were run. And in a lot of cases, um, it was it was a magical thing to watch. It's it, he has a very eerie way of communicating with his dogs. He just understands them, and they understand him. Um, and I think that's where he's happiest and possibly healthiest in a lot of ways. Um, you know, he's he's said in multiple interviews that he doesn't understand people as well as he understand do- understands dogs. He gets along with dogs better, which I totally identify with. <laughs> um, so it it's you know he's he's done something that if it's repeated, it will be a shocking repeat. I think it's more shocking to to think of a a repeat of a four-time Iditarod consecutive win plus the consecutive Yukon Quest wins in the same year. I I don't know if somebody else can do seven or eight championships like that, um, you know, in the span of four years. It's possible. You can't say it's impossible, but it's improbable. For sure. And before we run out of time here on our show tonight, we definitely want to get to the news. But just a a real quick recap uh, for for our new listeners. Of course, uh, us old timers know that, of course, he was diagnosed with cancer. He found out about it right after one of his wins. If I if I know the story correctly, uh, he has gone on to uh, do a documentary called The Great Alone. That is available. I'm looking right now. It's available on Amazon Prime, so you can check that out. Uh, There's been a book or two written either with him or about him that are definitely ones Mm -hmm. to check out. He's even done this show a couple of times uh, throughout his career, and you can find those on our archives over on dogworksradio.com. Just search Lance Mackey, and those will pop up. Of course, they're several years dated, but uh, it's still good information for sure. So, Tony, let's jump over to the story. As we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, uh, Greg from Iditarod did an interview with him. Lance was currently in, was at the time in the hospital 
uh, facing another bout of cancer. He was undergoing treatment and uh, a pretty telling interview. And I know you wrote a, a blog post about it as well. Of course, we're not going to speculate here on the show because we're not part of 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 his family or his care team or anything like that. But just sort of as a news and or information piece, what do you know about the interview and what did you share on your blog? Sure. So um, last fall, Lance announced uh, on his social media that his cancer had returned. Um, and so he was taking the season off. He would not be dog mushing. Um, he, I believe, either leased or sold most of his race dogs because he felt that it was unfair to them to not reach their potential and do what they were bred to do. Um, and then he kind of disappeared from social media. Uh, not that he was ever really big using the platform, um, but he, he really dove into not just his recovery, but um, he's now into racing cars and he has two small children that he uh, is raising alone because they've already lost their mother to an ATV rollover accident. Uh, not too long ago. I think it was two years ago now. Um, so we didn't really hear anything from Lance. And then I started to hear some rumblings right around the time of I did Rod sign up this year. Um, uh, there was a lot of talk that Lance was not quote unquote doing well. Um, and I wasn't you know, I didn't break that news to, to anyone because, again, like you said, we're not part of the care team. We're not part of the family. We're not part of that inner circle. And it was all just uh, speculation or rumor at that point. Um, but Greg Heister, who is the head of Iditarod Insider, um, came out with an interview, what, two Saturdays ago, Fridays ago? Um, where he spoke with Lance over the phone. Lance has been in the in and out of the hospital, he said, since right after Memorial Day. Um, and Lance also said that when he's not in the hospital, he is in a quote-unquote uh, hospital-type environment. He uh, has a hospital bed, he said, set up in his living room. And um, he's dealing with uh, not necessarily the cancer that he was diagnosed with in the fall. Um, he said that that's cleared up, but they found some other issues, I believe is how he put it. Um, so he's been in and out of the hospital. He's um, still mobile, he said, but very weak. He's lost 30 pounds um, over the course of this fight, which if you know Lance at all, um, he's as, and, and I'm not speculating here. He even commented, you know, he's, he isn't really, he didn't really need to lose a whole lot of weight. He's always been rather slim. Um, he says right now he looks like a rack of bones. Um, but you know, he, it, he was very lamp in his interview, you know, very matter of fact, very blunt in some ways. Um, but at the same time, he said he's not ready. He feels that he has a lot of life left, that he, um, you know, he doesn't think it's his time. But at the same time, he realizes that he isn't owed any more time than anyone else. Um, and so I think uh, one of the quotes that I used in my blog piece was he told Greg that, you know, um, if if it's his time to get off the bus, he'll get off the bus. Um, so, you know, his, he shared, Greg asked him if he was scared. He said he wasn't scared of anything, but he is scared for his kids. Um, like I said, they're, they're very young. Um, they've gone through a lot in their young lives already. Um, he and his extended family have done uh, what they can to give them a quote unquote normal life and the support that they need but they're going, they're, they're watching a very scary thing happen to their dad right now. And, and so he's kind of kept them away from the hospital. Um, and then he turned to um, just, you know, Greg gave him a moment to speak out to his fans. And he, um, you know, Lance hasn't been able to really be open with them since, uh, I think he said, uh, late 2020. And um, so he apologized for a few things that 
that happened that he hadn't been able to speak about um, because of everything that's just kind of snowballed from there. Um, it, for those that may not know or may not remember, um, Lance, after the 2020 Iditarod, um, he had uh, been caught uh, through the doping testing. He was caught using methamphetamine. Um, and so he went into a rehab program, came back from the rehab program, lost his partner, the mother of his children uh, soon after that, and then was diagnosed with the cancer. So it's just been one big snowball and he really hasn't had a chance to apologize. Um, and he did so in that interview, it was very heartfelt. I personally, um, as a fan of the sport and sometimes, and someone who has uh, followed Lance's career for many, many years. I, I think he worries a little too much about um, those of us who, you know, have followed him through thick and thin. He thinks that, you know, he's not worthy of that. Um, and I can assure you, Lance, uh, on behalf of many, many mushing fans around the world, that you are worth our prayers, our energy, our uh, good thoughts, you know, we all struggle at different times in our lives and that one mistake on top of whatever other mistakes he feels he's made in his life um, does not devalue him as a person. It wouldn't matter if he's a four-time I did a champion or not. Um, you know, that's just icing on the cake and something that he should be proud of and I know that he is and um it, it was a moving interview. You know, my dad and I, we were actually driving back from Anchorage when um, I think you even were the one that messaged me and said, hey, have you listened to the, the interview with Lance yet? And um, I said, no, but I used up all of my data for the month uh, listening to that on the drive home. Um, and it, it was, it was very moving. I, I'm going to tattle on my dad. He cried. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not overly emotional. Uh, Lance does get emotional a few times, but uh, for the most part, it's yeah. Lance is so special to the sport. He's so special to Alaska. He is so special to so many people. I've had a chance to chat with him a few times over the years at the Testamina 200 and other races, and you know he's just so personable and. He's been through so much already. He doesn't need to go through this again. And it just feels like he's getting way more crap than any one person deserves, no matter who they are. Um, and so my heart goes out to him. My heart goes out to the Mackey family. Um, I have reached out. Fans have asked me if there's anything that we, the fandom, can do for Lance. I've reached out. I've talked to a couple of his family members. Um, nothing is set up at this time, but I've, I've promised on social media that if I hear anything, I will definitely, definitely share it with, with my readers. Um, it, Lance is so humble, though. You know, I, I think it's very difficult for him to ask. Well, Tony, thank you for the update. And for our listeners on the radio show, it is time to come to an end. But if you're listening on the podcast, we have a little bit more about this. I guess this is sort of the after show of this episode. So we're going to sign off for the radio, but let's talk about uh, this a little bit more on the podcast. Let me put a quick pause here. Okay, Tony, let's talk a little bit more about uh, the after part of the of the uh, interview uh, for for folks that may or may not know. Right after the interview was released, uh, Lance and his and or his team uh, released pretty much the same uh, right. things that he said in the interview on his Facebook page. And that was, I believe, mm -hmm. if not the same day, the next day. Uh, when that was posted. So my first Yeah, question, it was about an hour. Yeah, yeah. So it was the same day then, and I think it was a Friday. Yeah. So my first question to you, Tony, is that was a couple of weeks ago. At that point, I believe he they recorded that just a day or two before that interview. Mm -hmm. I know he's talking about going to the racetrack. The racetrack typically happens on the weekend. I don't think he was able to do that because there was a uh, post- by um, Scott Jansen, who invited Nick Petit mm -hmm. out 
uh, that weekend, and he raced for the first time in Lance's uh, stock car here at the at the local racetrack. So that's just sort of an ancillary part of this story, and I guess that that uh, was a a big time. Uh, deal for Nick. Do you know anything about that other than what, than what I just said? Um, yeah, I reached out to someone on Nick's team. Um, she did not have any information on if Lance had actually made it out to the ra- racetrack because he did say that while he wouldn't be racing, he did want to take the kids out and watch and cheer on the racing team. Um, my understanding is Nick has been quietly doing this for most of the summer, uh, getting his little speed demon uh i don't know gusto out uh with uh driving race cars um so but yeah it was really interesting to see scott's post uh that happened right around the same time as the lance interview and 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 lance's post on social media um you know where he kind of announced that hey nick is nick is taking up uh lance's passion of uh car racing Um, I didn't actually follow through and and see how Nick did or anything like that, but um, it's, it's definitely, it, it, it felt like another kind of uh, piece to the puzzle. It's starting to make more sense why Nick was hanging out with Scott Jansen as much as uh, I was kind of seeing on Scott's social media. And um, so it's, yeah, you know, it, it's like we got all of this information and then it got quiet again. So I don't know exactly um, what that all means, if it means anything at all, or it, it definitely opens them up to speculation and that's not something I necessarily want to do. Um, but, you know, I I have to imagine that Lance and his family, his team, however we want to call it, um, they have to be relaying all of the comments. I'm looking at his post from August 5th right now, and it's got 774 comments and 66 shares, um, over 2.6 thousand uh, responses on this post. Um, And I know that that's just a handful of people because not everybody that follows the race is on social media or on Lance's social media. So, and that that was that yeah, was that was actually my next question. It, has there yeah. been? Has there <laughs> I'm just been, gonna jump ahead. <laughs> that's okay. Ha, there hasn't been any other uh, updates or releases since that yeah. interview and that social media post by Lance or I did a rod or anybody. Is that right? Yeah, I haven't seen anything. Um, like I said uh, earlier in the the show. Um, I did reach out, uh, I reached out to Brenda, who got me in touch with uh, a few of the family members uh, to see if if anything was being planned. Um, And, you know, the last thing I heard was a few days ago, just saying, nope, we don't have anything. We haven't heard anything. We passed it along to Lance and his partner to, um, you know, to just think about. Um, but I haven't heard anything more. I kind of want to feel like no news is good news. Um, but yeah, I've, I've reached out again. Like I said, I reached out to someone on Nick's team and I didn't actually follow up with her. She was going to tell me more about it, but then she didn't. So, uh, it's a busy time though with training and with Nick apparently racing cars. So, (laughs) Well, Tony, I know that Lance has listened to this show on numerous occasions. Uh, the times that really? I've spent with him, typically it's at races here locally, and, and he and I will mm-hmm. will uh, talk in passing, you know, spend a little bit of time. So I know he's listened because he always comments about something we have said on this show, whether it's uh, a, a correction, a, a, a commentary, <laughs> or something. So I know that he has listened to this show on occasion. I don't know if he's an avid follower, but uh, if he is, of course, we wish him well and uh, mm-hmm. hope hope for the best there. So my next and last question, Tony, is uh, aside from, you know, the 700 odd comments, I'm sure a lot of those are, are well wishes and prayers and, and that sort of thing on that comment thread. But I know that you're much more active on social media than I am, in particular on Twitter. What's sort of the fans' reaction to this? Uh, as you said, uh, he's, he was sort of dark for 
almost two years uh, since 2020, as you mm-hmm. said. And here we are two years later, we get this interview sort of right out of the blue. What's the overall fans' perspective other than, you know, well wishes and prayers? What are they saying on social media? I have not seen anything negative. I've seen nothing but positivity, not only for his um, his current battle with cancer, but also in response to what he said um, in the interview about having let the fans down by his decisions, his choices that he made uh, in early in 2020. Um, you know, most came on, uh, you know, they either ignored that part completely and just wanted to focus on the present and the future. Um, and others said, you know, you, you don't have anything to apologize for. You know, we've all been there making different choices that, that we regret later. Um, you know, he, he had said in his interview how embarrassed he was and, and people responded to that. They were very compassionate for, um, for what he's gone through. He's gone through a lot in his life. If you watch the great alone, you get a really good idea of who Lance is and how he, he became Lance Mackey in, in every sense, not just the dog musher, but as a person and, and all of the, the trials that he's gone through, um, and so I, I think, you know, a lot of fans, we've already, we've already been here. We, we know, we know that Lance, um, as just superhuman as he is, he's also fallible. He's like the rest of us. He's going to make mistakes. He's going to, he just has a bigger stage in which people can sit there in judgment, but I haven't seen a lot of that. Now, two years ago, sure, there was a lot of judgment, um, but I've, not seen that in the last year. I've seen compassion. I've seen empathy. I've seen general love from the fans and from the mushing community. Uh, you know, I don't even really see uh, any backbiting or, you know, jealousy out of out of any mushing camp that may or may not have any rivalry with him or had any rivalry. Many of the mushers that he used to just be the thorn in the side of, be it Jeff King or even the CVs, you know, everyone's come out with, you know, just well wishes for him. Um, And I think that's what makes Lance so special that even at his most annoying, if you want to call it that, there's still a lot of respect for him. There's still a lot of um, just wanting the best for him um, for whatever reason, you know, whatever motivates the person for wanting the best out of someone they, they may or may not truly know. Um, and so that's all, that's all I've really seen. I don't know if I'm just not looking in the right places for the drama, um, but I am pretty good about weeding through and finding the drama because we all like to watch drama on Facebook. But I haven't seen that. Um, I, I've just really seen positivity and light and love uh, to one of Mushing's greatest legends. Yeah, it, it's going to be interesting to see how the next chapter or two of this plays out. Uh, and of course, uh, as I said just a few minutes ago, we want to wish him well, his family well, mm-hmm. and of course, his kids, as he said in the interview, he's he's really worried about his kids. And of course, they have been through a heck of a lot over the last few years. They're still pretty young. Is that right? They are. Um, you know, I'm not sure just exactly how old they are. I want to say the oldest is he's got to be getting close to kindergarten or first grade, I would think, because he was down uh, Lance ran in the last couple of the Testamina 200s and his oldest, the oldest of the two, uh, he was toddling around and, and just, he, everyone fell in love with that kid. He was, he was everywhere. He was a ball of energy. If, if Lance has a mini me, I'm guessing it's that kid because uh, he was bouncing just as much as, as Lance was. Um, and there's actually, if you uh, go onto Facebook, you'll have to search for it, but there's a really cute picture that um, one of the, the other race photographers, not me, but one of the other race photographers took of him uh, with Lance. And Lance, I think, was napping at one of the checkpoints, and they were napping together on the floor or the couch, and it's just one of my favorite pictures. And um, so, you know, They've had a lot of special times with Lance, and 
if all goes well, then they're going to have many, many more. Um, but, you know, it's it's rough right now. And, and my heart goes out to those kids. You know, it, my heart goes out to all of them. It's it's really, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's, it's tough. It's, you want, you want to just wish it away for them. He doesn't, like I said, he doesn't, he doesn't need to go through this again. He's been through it enough times. He doesn't need, he needs, he needs bright, happy sunshine and meadows and unicorns and puppies and kittens and, and rainbows and olive glitter. And, and, you know, he doesn't need any more of the dark times. So he's, he's walked through the valley enough. Let's get him on the mountaintop again. Let's end on that. I think that's definitely a a, <laughs> uh, a good stopping point. Uh, Tony, thank you very much for your insight and uh, all that uh, you have done to to find out about it for for this show and of course uh, sharing things on your blog. I understand that that's getting a little bit of traction, and maybe we'll talk about that on our next show because uh, uh, that's that's what uh, that's what's intriguing. I think so. Guys that are avid listeners, we're going to take uh, a couple of weeks off. I'm heading down to Dallas to attend Podcast Movement, a major podcast conference. We go every year, and we're making an epic road trip out of it. Uh, My wife, Michelle, and I, if you really listen to this show, you know her voice as well. She does our our show on this feed, Dogworks Radio. So we're going to go down and see what we can learn from those folks at Podcast Movement, and we always bring back something cool to add to the show, whether it's tech or new ways of doing things or something uh, to make our show a little bit better. So we're looking forward to that. So we will be back after Labor Day, and as we said at the top of the show, that's when things really start to kick off uh, in terms of training and thinking about racing, and of course, right after that, a lot of the Mid-distance races will open up their entries in September and October, so we'll really see how the season is shaping up at that point because there's a lot of drama, not necessarily bad drama, that happens in (laughs) October, and in particular with the rookies that are thinking of, not not rookies this year in Iditarod, but next year's rookies or the year after when they think about uh, doing their qualifiers and whether they're able to get in the, in the one they want, or if they finish those, or if they have good race seasons and all that. So we'll talk about that in the coming shows for sure. So, Tony, thank you very much for, for your time tonight, and we'll talk again soon, all right? Sounds good. Have a good trip. Thank you. On behalf of my co-host, this is Robert. We'll see you guys next time. Goodbye. From Dog Works Radio, this is Mushing Radio. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And we invite you to subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find a link on the episode notes. You can tap or swipe on the episode cover art, and you'll see some offers from our sponsors. You can support our show by supporting them. If you like what you have heard, we would love it if you could give us a five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe, too. Your host is Robert Forto. Our producers are Michelle Forto, Alex Stein, and Tony Ryder. Our executive producer is Robert Forto. Created for DogWorks Radio and First Paw Media.